guys, we are going to pick up where we kind of left off, which was uh, the end of chapter two. We were talking a lot about cell injury and adaptations and repair. Um, and today what we're going to talk about are free radicals. Um, and your book, chapter two, kind of glosses over this a little bit, kind of identifies what it is. Um, I want to go over this with a bit more detail because of how important this is for normal physiology, for exercise physiology, for pathology. Free radicals kind of play a role in everything, um, especially if you guys are interested in nutrition. So nutrition is kind of getting a lot of attention right now with the free radicals and um, beginning to, sorry, my phone is ringing, uh, beginning to get a lot of attention on how what we eat might cause uh, an excess amount of free radicals because of the absence in um, antioxidants, which are in a lot of plants. Uh, so those of you that are eating diets that are heavy in plants, good for you because you're taking in a tremendous amount of uh, antioxidants, which will assist you in fighting free radicals. Um, and those of you that aren't eating many plants at all, you're not getting those uh, antioxidants that are necessary to neutralize free radicals. So today we're going to talk about these free radicals, what they are, where they come from, and uh, what role they play in pathology. So uh, this is essentially what we're going to go over. Uh, what is a free radical? How are they created? Sources, the type of damage they do, and the prevention. So um, one of the most important mechanisms in cellular injury, cell, I'm sorry, cellular injury, is injury that is induced by free radicals, especially reactive oxidative species. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about in depth today is ROS or reactive oxygen species. And what is that? Well, the species kind of tells you that it's just kind of different formations or variations of molecular oxygen. Um, so we're going to kind of get into that and talk about what that is and what that looks like. Um, this form of injury that, that is induced by free radicals is also known as oxidative stress. And this kind of occurs when an excess amount of reactive oxygen species overwhelms our endogenous antioxidant system. So we want to have a nice balance of uh, free radical production because it is a natural part of metabolism. It is a natural part of aerobic respiration. Uh, we, we, we create them all the time, but we do have systems in place which can basically neutralize them quickly or turn them into a different types of species, convert them into a different types of species that is not reactive and is not considered a, rea a radical. Therefore, it's something that is not um, dis uh, disadvantageous towards the cellular environment. So let's talk a little bit about what these guys are. Okay, so when cells use oxygen to generate energy, uh, which you all know very well because we're in exercise science and we know how important uh, oxygen is for ATP production, specifically in the mitochondria. Well, when we use oxygen to generate energy, free radicals are created um, basically as a consequence of ATP production in the mitochondria. So this happens all the time. So again, free radicals are highly reactive and unstable molecules, and they're produced in the body naturally as a byproduct of metabolism or oxidation. Um, or we can also get them from exposure to toxins in the environments. We can get them if free radicals are generated through tobacco, um, ultraviolet light, lots of things kind of generate these things. Um, now, free radicals have a lifespan of only a fraction of a second. So they have a, they have a very short half-life. Um, but during the time, but during that time, these things can do a lot of damage to different proteins in the cell, uh, DNA, they can lead to mutations, uh, mutations that can cause cancer, especially if they're on uh, specific genes. So, so, so even though they have a very short lifespan, they can do a lot of damage to the cellular environment. And what a free radical is, is it's essentially an atom or a molecule with an unpaired electron. So here you can see that we have a free radical and on its outer, especially when we're talking about oxygen, on its outer orbit, 
we have this kind of single unpaired electron, and, and oxygen doesn't like that. Oxygen likes to have four electrons on its outer orbit. So one of the things that antioxidants do is they provide stability by providing an extra electron for this unstable oxygen molecule, right? So um, it, when we are in this state of an unpaired electron, we are we're in a state of uh, instability. So this creates an unstable and reactive molecule that will steal electrons from other molecules. So if an antioxidant doesn't come in here and stabilize this thing and give it an electron, then what's going to happen is it's going to want to steal an electron from something else or it's going to want to get rid of this electron to create stability. So that's why this is called a radical and that's why it's reactive because it's going to interact uh, with anything in the environment that it wants to. And that could be proteins, that could be enzymes, that can be the lipid bilayer, that could be DNA. Um, anything that it wants to interact with, uh, it can do so. So um, this can also lead, as I said, to, to mutations in the gene. So, but again, we, we have systems in place. That's what's important that you understand that is, is we have systems in place, which are antioxidants. And we also have other enzymes that we'll talk about, such as superoxide dismutase and catalase and things like that, that help kind of neutralize and kind of create a less aggressive form of this reactive uh, radical here. So um, we do have systems in place that can kind of take care of that. So let's talk a little bit about how this instability happens here. Um, and we're going to talk about just some basic, basic uh, chemistry. And you guys might remember this from basic chemistry. And if you don't, that's fine. We're going to talk about it here. Uh, I'm going to discuss uh, what the concepts are. Uh, about oxidation and reduction. So let's take a look at this next slide. And here you can see the term oxidation and reduction. And I have this kind of cool picture here that really helps kind of put this into perspective. Because I know when I was doing organic chemistry and my biochemistries, biochemistries this uh, this concept always confused me. And even to this day, I have to stop and think about it. So it never really comes easy. So we have um, oxidation, which is loss of an electron. And you can see here that oxidation is the loss of the electron or increasing oxidation state by an atom molecule or ion. So I also like to call this, this kind of helps me keep things in mind. This is the electron donating species because this guy here is donating an electron and we call that oxidation. And then we have reduction, which is the gain of electron. And this is where it's counterintuitive because you're like, oh, if you're gaining something, why are, why are we, we reducing that in volume? Well, this has to do with the charge because if we get something that is more negative and we gain another negative charge, then we have a reduction in charge. Um, and I like to call reduction the, the molecule that is receiving the electron. You guys see that there. This is the electron accepting species. So this is how I always refer to them uh, when I can't remember exactly uh, what they are, because I, I, I get a little I get a little confused at times as well. So it's basically passing of electrons. And when we pass electrons, one of something might become stable and something might become unstable. So um, just kind of keep these processes in mind and don't worry about this uh, homolytic cleavage. We're not, we're not going to talk about that. That's really not necessary for what we're doing here. Um, but again, oxidation is loss of and reduction is gain of. So, so very, very basic. Um, so the other thing that's really interested before we kind of get into the heavy, heavy, I guess, uh, redox biology here, um, we want to talk a little bit about the duplicity of free radicals. Okay, so let, let's just kind of go back and look at this. So we know that a free radical has this unpaired electron. It's been passed by something and it either wants to steal an electron to gain stability or it wants to get rid of this electron to stay, to uh, obtain stability. So it's, it's looking to stabilize itself because if it doesn't, it's going to be in this reactive state, right? It's going to, it's going to be very destructive. Um, and we know that that process of gaining and losing uh, is oxidation and reduction. So if we say something becomes reduced, that means it's taken on this electron. Um, 
But what it's really important to understand is that the body sometimes uses free radicals for beneficial functions. And I know thus far I was talking about like, okay, well, um, you know, these things are harmful. They can cause damage. They can, you know, cause mutations. They can cause, uh, they can create other radicals. Um, but sometimes they, they play a physiological role as well. So I like to refer to these molecules, these reactive oxidative species or oxygen species, as Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Of course, Dr. Jekyll would be the useful or the purposeful use of free radicals, and Mr. Hyde would be the, um, the damaging or the injurious uh, effect of free radicals in the system. So one of the most interesting aspects of free radicals is their dual roles in physiology. And one of the most important natural roles of um, free radical production is uh, how they're used in the immune response. So free radicals are essentially uh, one of the primary molecules that are involved in killing pathogens that get into your body. Um, they also play a very important important role in regulating cell growth. So when you're, you know, if you're, if you're undergoing hypertrophy or uh, differentiation of a cell, um, that free radicals play a role in that. Um, the immune system, for example, takes advantage of free radicals um, by using it to uh, basically neutrophils, uh, neutrophils and other immune cells are going to use, basically create free radicals. They're going to house them in a very specific vesicle, and then when they engulf uh, some type of bacteria or some type of uh, pathogen, they're going to release those free radicals to essentially destroy uh, whatever it is they're engulfing. So like I said, free radicals like to destroy uh, proteins and lipids and uh, genetic material, and if you're bringing in, if you're engulfing some sort of pathogenic a uh, parasite or a pathogen, well, those things are probably going to have lipids and proteins and a genetic code, and they're going to release these, these neutrophils are going to release these free radicals uh, to essentially destroy that, to remove it from your body. So again, very, very important uh, phagocytes and phagosomes, those things that we talked about in uh, chapter two, uh, play a big role in that. Um, free radicals unquestionably um, are a part of muscle skeleton, uh, skeletal muscle damage. Uh, and free radical production is uh, when we have contraction, muscle contraction, and we have vigorous muscle contraction, we, we produce free radicals and they play a big role in the DOMS process, right? Delayed onset muscle soreness. So, um, the, these, uh, these radicals, they do play a role in physiological processes and also, uh, there was some work being done by Powers, uh, Scott Powers, I believe, uh, where they are talking about how free radicals uh, and the production of free radicals play a major role in muscle force production. So not only do they assist in the repairing process of the muscle, uh, they also assist as they believe that they're playing roles as secondary messengers in force production. And uh, there was some research out there that I was reading that when they knocked out the enzymes in rodents uh, that produce free radicals, because free radicals are produced either enzymatically or non-enzymatically, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But when they knocked out the genes that produce those enzymes and, and these rodents could not basically generate certain reactive oxygen species, they saw a major reduction in muscle force production. So uh, now research is being looked into with how, how these uh, species of oxygen and their different variations uh, play a role in muscle force production. So very, very cool research, very cool stuff. Um, okay, so now let's kind of talk a little bit about um, Ross formation. And as I told you, we talked about uh, enzymes are very important in producing uh, free radicals or reactive oxygen species. And then there's some non-enzymatic reactions uh, that occur as well. Uh, we kind of favor these enzymatic reactions because those are generally regulated and uh, they have fail safes where if something is, uh, if an enzyme is creating too much of one thing, then there's usually these fail safes or these uh, monitors within the cell that can shut down that production. 
uh, and, and usually reactions in the cell, we, we, we generally don't want non-enzymatic reactions because those aren't regulated. These things can just happen uh, whenever they want to happen. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about these enzymes. And we're going to go through these. Here's where we're going to start getting into the kind of heavier science of things. Um, and I'm going to do some drawings for you guys and we'll kind of talk about uh, this a little bit. Um, so the major, major source of uh, free radicals or reactive, reactive oxygen species is in the respiratory chain or the electron transport chain, right? So this is where we're going to have all those enzymes uh, within the mitochondria, which are going to be those complexes in the electron transport chain. You know, there's, there's four of them uh, that are going to kind of play a role in generating free radicals. And we're going to look at that in detail. Uh, another thing is phagocytosis. So when we have phagocytes or we have these immune response cells that are going to be engulfing debris or engulfing pathogens or bacteria or just things that do not belong in our body, uh, these phago the phagocytes are going to release free radicals via phagocytosis. And you can kind of see, I have a picture here that we're going to look at in more detail, but you can see that this phagocyte here is engulfing this bacteria and it is once this bacteria kind of binds to the phagocytes through these receptors you can see that this phagocyte here is releasing uh this is a free radical here called superoxide this is very 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 dangerous and then we have another one here which is h2o2 this is hydrogen peroxide and it is using these pre-created um, oxygen species to basically destroy this thing, right? So um, we have these respiratory bursts, and that's really important that you understand that these are bursts. They're not always on. They're just kind of uh, intermittently bursted um, towards this dangerous bacteria, and the bursts will stop once the bacteria has, has perished or has been destroyed by uh, the free radicals. So we'll talk about that a little more. Uh, prostaglandin synthesis. This is very important in wound healing. So we produce free radicals when we do some wound healing. Um, and I was going to talk to you guys about cytochrome uh, P40, P450, but um, I put this here, but we're not actually going to talk about that because I really want to focus on this one here and I don't want to make this lecture incredibly long. So what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about that's missing an apostrophe. Let me fix that because it will drive me mad. Um, we're going to talk about the mitochondria and we're going to talk about the enzymes that are um, involved in creating uh, different species of oxygen that occurs naturally. Like I said, it can be a natural part of metabolism uh, it, within a certain concentration of free radical production. We have the capacity to neutralize it and to remove it. Um, and then when we get into, and of course, this is a pathology class. So, but when we get into a place where we produce more free radicals than our capacity, than our um, cellular protection system can handle, that's when we get into oxidative stress because there's more free radicals than there are um, particular elements in the cell that can neutralize it. And I'm being very vague because I, I don't want to get into too much. We could spend months talking about uh, redox biology and pathology, but I'm just trying to keep this vague so you just understand the basic principles. And that's why I'm, I'm not mentioning superoxide dismutase and catalase and, and um, uh, glutathione and all these kind of antioxidants protection systems or enzymes that can help neutralize these, but I, I don't want to get too much into that. But what I do want to focus on is going over the mitochondria because for exercise science, this is very important for generating ATP. And um, yeah, so let's look at this. So on this next slide, I just want to kind of refresh your memory on um, the respiratory chain or the electron transport chain and whatever you want to call it. I know that there's multiple uh, titles for this thing. Um, and we're just going to kind of go through this, right? We know that glucose comes in. Glucose will go through glycolysis. Um, 
glucose can either be turned into, where is it? Uh, it's not here. Uh, here it is. Yep. Lactate, right? So it can either be turned into lactic acid or lactate, or uh, through this process of glycolysis, we can convert this six carbon molecule into two, three carbon molecules. And we know that the pyruvate is readily available to go into uh, the mitochondria, and it will do so by being converted into acetyl-CoA, um, which will then enter the citric acid cycle, and then it will go into uh, basically energy production through the electron transport chain, right? So here's here's where that's at, right? And look at here. This picture shows that in this electron transport chain, if everything is successful and we pass, uh, you know, these um, electron carrying molecules, right, where we're getting all these electrons from, you can see that they're going here and they're donating those electrons to these complexes here uh, to help create the proton gradient, right, to, to create ATP. But all these electrons that are being passed, you know, through NAD and NADH, obviously, if we have a proton, which is the hydrogen, we're also going to have an electron that follows that. All of these electrons that are being passed, they can falter in this electron transport chain. And, and it happens naturally. It occurs under normal metabolism. But things can also go horribly wrong. And we can have uh, dysregulation of this electron transport chain. And then oxygen can be given uh, electrons. And basically, it, could be, it can cause instability. So we know that at complex four, we're going to call this one, two, three, four, we know that um, oxygen should have four hydrogens and four electrons, right? And we know that that will convert uh, oxygen into water, right? That's what should happen there. But if something goes wrong and that oxygen doesn't get all four of those electrons, well, then we're going to have an oxygen that is unstable and we get different oxygen species. So I'm just trying to prepare you for what's coming down the pipe from this, right? So uh, if we look at this, right, we can see those complexes again, right? One, two, three, and four. And you can see here that oxygen is here. And ideally, we want oxygen to be converted into H2O. Well, if everything goes right, ATP will be generated and we won't have any free radical production. However, if things don't go right, and I'm keeping this very vague on purpose, right? I'm not, we're not going to name all these enzymes or we're not going to talk about all that. Uh, that's, that's not this course. Um, but if the electrons, you see this, are start kind of uh, being passed to oxygen at different stages, well, then we get, you can see oxygen here. And if oxygen takes on a single electron, well, then we have something called superoxide, which is a unstable, highly destructive uh, free radical. And it's being produced because the electrons weren't passed properly through these complexes, right? Because these electrons should be passed this way and be donated to oxygen here so that oxygen can be converted into H2O. But this is not a perfect system. And the electron transport chain, it makes mistakes. And that's how we start to get these free radicals because there have been mistakes made and the electrons are seeping out. And basically oxygen is picking them up when it shouldn't pick them up. Okay. And, and that's the basics of it. So, so let's like, let's, let's do it. Let's, let's draw. Okay. Let's go into a bit of a, uh, a bit of a discussion here where we can talk about um, these things in greater detail. So give me one second. Let me see if I can get my prefabricated drawing set up for you guys. Hopefully this, this turns out well. Okay, let's see how this goes. So here we can see, let me kind of make it a little bigger, uh, and I will kind of use my pencil here. Here we can see kind of a schematic of oxygen, and we can see that um, we have, I'm going to point right here, we have red blood cells. In the red blood cells, let's just kind of acquaint you with what's happening here. The red blood cells are up top, right here. And the red blood cells are coming through the capillaries, and of course the red blood cells were uh, passing through the heart. They went into the right atrium, the right ventricle. 
They got ejected up to the pulmonary system where the oxygen uh, interacted with the red blood cells and the iron and the hemoglobin and basically bound to the hemoglobin and then back down into the left atrium, into the left ventricle and out into the body, right? So we have these red blood cells and they're being delivered via capillaries uh, to skeletal muscle that needs them. And here we can see we have the sarcolemma. You guys can see that right here, right? I, I even identified it for you. There it is right there. And the red blood cells are going to basically let go of the oxygen because there's low pressure and red blood cells like to be released uh, when there's lower pressure. They like to bind when there's higher partial pressure. So these oxygen molecules, they've been released and they're going to diffuse through the skeletal muscle. And there's the diffusion, right? And basically they're going to get picked up by something called myoglobin. So you can see that I placed myoglobin right here. And myoglobin also, we, I identified it as MB, right? Myoglobin is going to come up here. It's going to bind to the oxygen and it's going to carry that oxygen throughout the, the cytosol of, of the skeletal muscle. So here you can see we have oxygen bound to myoglobin and then myoglobin is going to release that oxygen and oxygen is going to go into the mitochondria, right? And when it's in the mitochondria, it's basically, it's basically going to just kind of wait until it is needed. Uh, by the electron transport chain. So also, you know that in the, in the mitochondria, we have, oops, what happened to my pen? It just shut off. We have fatty acids that are going to make their way down into the citric acid cycle. And we have glucose, right? We have these energy molecules that are also going to either be converted into pyruvate where it can, you can see this three carbon molecule here, pyruvate will enter the mitochondria. Uh, it will be converted to acetyl CoA and then it'll enter the TCA cycle. We'll get a lot of those NADH and FAD uh, generated. And then those energy, those energy carrying molecules, the NADH and the FADH, um, they're going to essentially bring those electrons to I draw this picture here to this electron transport chain and i, I just kind of let me see if i can highlight with this let me see if i can change the color here i'm learning this new software but i got it just so i can kind of help you guys a little more um i put down here this electron transport chain you guys see that it's this kind of black swiggly line here and then i put etc and we know that if everything goes right, we have substrate delivery, right? And we have oxygen delivery. I'm just kind of highlighting now. We know that we're going to hopefully get ATP generation. That makes sense, right? So this is how all that works. And, and we know that. We, we, we know the basics. So now let's kind of zoom in. Let's zoom in. On. Let me just change the color a little bit here. Change the color to yellow. Let's zoom in a little bit on this section here. All right. So I'm, I'm coloring it again. Now it's kind of looking like just kind of vomit color because I got all these things mixed together. All right. So this is just kind of showing you how oxygen gets where it needs to go. We have these intermediate myoglobin molecules that are going to bring it to the mitochondria. We have the red blood cells up here that are kind of doing their job and delivering it, right? Dropping off the oxygen. And then we have this kind of perfect recipe here where we can now make some energy or we can make some free radicals, right? And this is where the interesting thing happens. Okay, so now we're zoomed in on the mitochondria. Here's another one of my wonderful drawings. And what you should notice is down here, uh, and this could just kind of happen anywhere, we are going to, right about here, we are going to put in um, the major enzymes that are involved in passing the electrons and possibly faltering and giving electrons to oxygen when they shouldn't do so. So I'm not going to go through the names. I'm not going to go through the electron transport chain. I'm just showing you where this stuff comes from because 
We talked about this in great detail in uh, exercise physiology. We talked about it in exercise biochemistry. You've talked about it in physiology. You've probably talked about it in nutrition. So we're not going to spend a lot of time uh, discussing the, the intricacies of, of the electron transport chain. Uh, I just want you to basically get an idea of what's happening down here and where these free radicals are, are coming from. So we are just going to call these um, complex one, complex two, complex three, and complex four. That's all, all we're going to uh, essentially talk about. So we know that when the electron carriers, um, NADH or FADH2, uh, bring the electrons to the mitochondria, they're going to interact with complex one and complex two. And we know that they're essentially going to drop off the electron. They're going to drop off the cargo, which is the proton and the electron. And that electron is then going to, let me see if I can kind of just, and we're just going to do this very quickly and not, not worrying tremendously about accuracy. Um, that electron here, let me see if I can circle it, is going to want to be passed between um, complex one, complex two, this coenzyme right here, uh, and eventually get to complex three. But mistakes can happen there, right? So it's eventually going to pass through here. I'm going to make squiggly lines, pass through here, pass through here, and get to complex three. But sometimes that doesn't happen. Also, we can have the electrons that go from three to four, because we're going to have electrons being passed through here, through, through cyto C, and to complex four, these electrons here can be passed off inappropriately or uh, it, they can be given to oxygen at uh, non-specific times, right? Because ideally what we want to do is we want to give, let me draw here, sorry, I got a lot of stuff here. We want to have oxygen receive four electrons and four hydrogens and be converted into H2O, right? H2O is, is a substance in the body that is not harmful, right? However, let me, let me get rid of this. However, sometimes these, let me erase some, some more of this here. Sometimes, let's get rid of this kind of mess here. Sometimes these electrons can basically go rogue, right? So we can have electrons that seep out and bind to oxygen. And now oxygen becomes unstable and reactive, right? So when we have oxygen that basically receives an electron when it shouldn't be receiving an electron, we get something called superoxide, and that looks like this. Oh, that shouldn't be there. And I'm just going to say superoxide. All right, and superoxide is a it's a radical. It is something that is uh, highly destructive, and it is something that can cause damage very quickly to uh, proteins, genetic uh, genetic material, lipids. Um, we know that the mitochondria has two lipid bilayers, right? We know it mitochondria has its own DNA. Uh, we know there's lots of proteins in the mitochondria. Um, we can also have, if let's just say there's a mistake here, right? We could have this electron be passed off here and oxygen can pick up an electron and then it could become a free radical, right? So now we have these destructive, uh, radicals or these species that can be harmful within the cell and, and they're coming from this area, this mitochondria, right? So now superoxide can, it can be neutralized. And I, I don't want to say neutralized, but it can be made into a, a less harmful material. So we have something in inside the mitochondria called superoxide dismutase, okay? And I'm just going to write S. D, and I'll spell dismutase, right? D-I-S-M-U, right? And then what does an enzyme always have? ACE, 
there's the ACE. Okay, so we have superoxide dismutase. And what superoxide dismutase will do is it will help convert superoxide into, this is hydrogen peroxide, so I'll write this for you. Um, hydrogen peroxide. Okay, now, you're probably sitting here saying, oh my God, uh, this I'm never going to learn all this. Okay, just know that oxygen will take an electron uh, when it shouldn't. So we want oxygen to be fully reduced. What does reduced mean? Reduced means it wants to receive electrons. And we know that oxygen in the mitochondria, to be fully reduced, it wants to receive four electrons and that way it gets converted into H2O, uh, yep, water, and it's not harmful. But if we have, let me highlight, let me get this. If we have electrons that are just kind of seeping out and binding to oxygen before oxygen gets fully reduced, then we start creating radicals. And we have, or, or non-radicals, but we, these, these still can be reactive oxygen species, but we have radicals and we have non-radicals. I'm not going to test you on that. That's not what we're, what we're talking about here. Um, so we have oxygen, which when it receives an electron prematurely, right here, it turns into this. And this must, this superoxide, it must be dealt with immediately. And as I said, we have things in the cell within the mitochondria that could help neutralize it. And in this case, we have superoxide dismutase, which is going to convert it into something slightly less harmful. Now, you guys know what hydrogen peroxide is, right? Hydrogen peroxide is that uh, liquid that we get inside of our, that opaque or that kind of brown bottle, right? It's light sensitive. So you guys have all had hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide before. So what's really interesting about hydrogen peroxide is hydrogen peroxide could go one of two ways also. So it can get converted. So hydrogen peroxide can interact with another protective mechanism in the cell that we call, let me change this, that we call catalase, C-A-T, right? Like cat, A-L-A-S-E. And we know that that's an enzyme, right? So catalase can interact with this less harmful free radical, and it can turn that into H2O. Okay, so catalase can help kind of neutralize hydrogen peroxide and turn it into H2O. So we have, let me change my colors here. So we have things, uh, let's do this guy. This looks kind of pretty. Let's do this. We have things in the mitochondria and even outside the mitochondria, they're both inside and outside. We have these things here that can help neutralize them, right? And then we get basically water, right? So we had hydrogen, we had superoxide. Superoxide was converted into something less harmful. And then hydrogen peroxide, because of something called catalase, was converted into H2O, right? So this is these are how these things kind of work. Um, but but hydrogen peroxide. Uh, it could also go into, uh, it can go the other direction. So hydrogen peroxide can also be converted into something called, and this one's kind of important, hydroxy radical. Okay, so that is H. Let me see if I remember how to spell this. H-Y-D-R-O, I think. D-R-O. And then X-Y-L, I think. I think that's how we spell it. Okay. Now, hydroxyl radical is something that is very, very dangerous uh, and it destroys um, things very quickly in the cell. So, um, and we're, the reason I'm drawing this for you now is because we're going to talk about it in later slides. So I'm just trying to show you how these things come to be. Because anything with anything with redox biology is really hard to wrap your head around. So I, I just kind of wanted to show you how these things kind of form. And, um, and 
yeah, so that's that's the gist of it. So so again, um, let me change my color one more time. Let's just kind of go through it one more time, and then uh, we will start talking about. Let's do a color we haven't done yet, like this guy. So, sorry, my headphone jack just fell out. Let me let me fix this really quick. Um, I'm left-handed, and I should probably move the microphone to my right side. That would have been smart about an hour ago. Oh my gosh, that makes so much more sense. Um, so we know that oxygen has been delivered to the mitochondria. Um, we know that, let me see if I can kind of zoom this in here. We know that electrons that are brought in by not only NADH, but also by, what's the other one? F A D. That should be a D H two. We know that these electron carrying molecules are generated uh, in glycolysis, the TCA cycle, right? Oxidative phosphorylation also it's generated there. And um, these are the molecules that are responsible for passing the electrons through the electron transport chain. So if you wanna start thinking about a disease state and how free radicals might be created in an uncontrollable way, we can, we can actually think of nutrition, right? So we could think about, okay, well, if somebody's eating more food, eating more refined sugars, you know, maybe activating glycolysis a bit more, um, we could be producing more of these uh, energy carrying, electron carrying molecules, NADH and FADH. Too. So, um, and what happens then is if we're creating more of these, these can easily drop off more electrons that are going to override the system. Um, as you know, when we exercise, we increase our mitochondria density. We make more mitochondria. So we're able to handle more of these electron carrying molecules, NADH and FADH2. Where if we're sedentary and we, we're not doing anything, we have only a limited amount of mitochondria, but we're eating more food and we're, we're bringing more of these electron carriers down, well, we can, override the, we can override the system and these electron transport chains might not be able to handle the flux of electron carriers that are coming in. And this is one theory. There's multiple theories to this, okay? So, and then what happens is the mitochondria will start to generate let me move here. The mitochondria will start to generate. I'm going to draw here. Mitochondria, right? It will start to generate more. I'm just going to draw superoxide. It'll start to generate more superoxide than superoxide dismutase, right? Which is that enzyme or catalase can handle. So it won't be able to convert those things or neutralize them. And then what happens is when we get these free radicals, superoxide being generated and then H2O2 being generated and hydroxyl radical being generated, that's when we get into oxidative stress. And I'm just going to put OS. And it's stressful. It's oxidative stress because there's so much of this being generated that the cells can no longer fight the amount of free radicals being created. Okay, so that's how that all works. So I'm going to stop showing you my three-year-old drawing and we're going to move on to more of the lecture slides. All right. So uh, I promise you I'm not going to draw any more the rest of this lecture. Um, but let's talk about uh, the other enzymatic ways that Ross, uh, and again, Ross is reactive oxygen species. And I, and I showed you, I, I showed you a couple of species, right? Let me, let me just go back here, right? I showed you superoxide, which is a different species of normal oxygen. Does that make sense? I showed you hydrogen peroxide, which is a different species of normal oxygen, molecular oxygen. And also it's a species that is different than superoxide. And then we also have these other uh, intermittent uh, species that are created, which we'll talk about in a little more detail in a bit. But I just wanted to show you that like... That is what ROS, the reactive oxygen species, stands for. So now we are talking about phagocytosis, right? So we know uh, phagocytosis uh, or phagocytes mediate their innate immunological response 
by releasing products that damage invading microorganisms. And I showed you here, we have this bacteria, right? So we have this uh, microorganism here that when it gets into the body, it gets sick. You can see another one here, right? We have this bacteria here. So these products that they use to help um, damage these invading organisms are oxygen species. And the, the ones that are used are superoxide. So let me kind of zoom in here. You guys can see there that is. So we have the oxygen and it's being converted into this superoxide. And this is being done by an enzyme called NADPH oxidase. Basically, it's doing the same thing. It's taking an electron from NADH and it's attaching it to this oxygen. And when it does that, it makes this unstable uh, oxygen species here. And then we have NADP plus because we lost the electron, right? So this NADPH, we lost the hydrogen with the hydrogen. We lost the electron. The electron was given to this oxygen. And now we have this free radical here which is going to basically damage the bacteria. It's going to kill the bacteria. And on the other side here, we have this other oxidase. You don't need to know the name. I'm just showing you, um, just showing you what is happening here. This enzyme is also creating hydrogen peroxide. So we have hydrogen peroxide and we have superoxide and they're playing a role in destroying this bacteria, right? So the production of superoxide free radicals by this phagocyte is what is helping destroy the invading organism. So this is an example where um, free radicals are being used in an advantageous way. Okay. And you can read here what I put is that obviously a phagocyte is a, is it's an immune cell and it has the ability to ingest and sometimes digest foreign particles. And that could be cellular debris, right? that could be bacteria, uh, carbon, dust, or dye. Uh, it engulfs these bodies into its cytoplasm, and then it basically destroys it. It bombards it with different types of different species of oxygen. So again, advantageous. Um, and then we have, I mentioned, oh, that's a little, let me zoom out a little bit. There we go. That's a little... Um, we also have something called prostaglandin synthesis or prostaglandins, which if you don't know where that, what that is, you don't have to go very deep into trying to figure out what it is. But prostaglandins are essentially they're a, a group of lipids um, and they're basically created at the site of tissue damage or at sites of tissue infection. And these prostaglandins, they're involved with dealing with, with basically injury to a, a tissue. Um, and they control the pro they control processes such as inflammation, blood flow, and the formation of blood clots. So they're, they're a big part of that, that labor, uh, of, of in the inflammatory response and informing and in, in creating blood clots. Um, these are also really powerful vasodilators, um, that uh, play a role in, in basically getting the inflammatory response to the tissue that needs it uh, much quicker. So there are free radicals that are also generated in this response. So when you are, when you basically experience an injury to a tissue, free radicals are generated here and, and they're not in this role, they're not destroying tissue they're, they're assisting in generating new tissue. And again, also maybe getting rid of some debris. So just some examples of where we use these favorably, right? Where, when I showed you this up here, when we were talking about this and this, we were talking about, okay, well, this is where they, and, and again, it goes back to that Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. This is where it can be Mr. Hyde. Um, yeah, Mr. Hyde. And then here's where it can kind of be uh, Dr. Jekyll. All right. So we talked about different enzymes, right? And let me just, let me just kind of go through this one more time. And, and um, again, you don't need to know the names of these because I'm already giving you a lot to digest here. Um, when we talk about the, and I'll zoom in, when we talk about enzymes that produce free radicals, in this case, we're talking about the electron transport chain and all the enzymes that are involved in that process. They can create 
free radicals. And if we zoom in, which we, we did in my horrible drawings, right? Look like that. If we zoom in, these complexes are the enzymes that want to convert oxygen into uh, water, but it, sometimes they make mistakes. And this enzyme here can donate an electron prematurely. This, this, uh, this uh, substrate here, I'm sorry, this um, complex here can donate one prematurely. Um, and then we can kind of get the creation of these unfavorable species of oxygen, right? Here we have um, an ADPH oxidase, an enzyme, um, malleoperoxidase up here, which can produce um, uh, hydrogen peroxide. Um, NO synthase, right, which is going to produce nitric oxide. Um, you don't need to know the names of these. I'm just kind of showing you that these ACEs, right, these oxidases are creating these free radicals, all right? Um, and that's all you really, and then also when we have prostaglandin synthase, synthesis, we have free radicals that are, are produced as well. Uh, here, it's favorable here. It's favorable here. Um, it's favorable as well, because if we have free radicals being produced, um, in the mitochondria, there is research being conducted that these things are assisting in force production. Now they don't know if it's coming from the mitochondria or within your skeletal muscle, and I know this because I did my research on this for my dissertation, within your skeletal muscle, we have these enzymes NADPH oxidase, and we have two different forms of them. Uh, we have NOx1 and NOx4, and I, and I know that because I, I actually discovered it in human skeletal muscle. So that's like my claim to fame that nobody knows about and that nobody will ever know about. And we know that in human skeletal muscle, this NADPH oxidase is also producing uh, free radicals, and it's not doing it in the mitochondria. It's doing it within the cytosol and within the. We believe that it's 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 bound to the sarcolemma of of the skeletal muscle. Um, so we know that NADPH oxidase exists in phagocytes, and we know that it exists in skeletal muscle uh, somewhere on the sarcolemma, but we don't know what it's doing in, in skeletal muscle. So it might be assisting with, with, uh, as acting as a secondary messenger that helps with force, force, force production. Sorry, I've been talking for a long time now. Uh, we also know that free radicals are, play a role in helping tissue uh, regeneration. Uh, so, so they're helpful, right? They're not hurting us all the time. Okay. And as I told you before, there were also non-enzymatic ways of producing ROS. And we're not going to talk a lot about this. Um, but in, in disease, in cases of diseases, uh, this is generally when we have a lot of uh, unregulated, unintentional um, production of these radicals. So in various disorders, um, this will occur. And, and two of the major compounds that are involved in this is methylglyoxal and glyoxyl, and they basically contribute to oxidative injury. And, and we're, again, this, we're not going to go into this at all. I'm just showing you here that methylglyoxyl is one of the, one of the contributors of non-enzymatic ROS production. Um, and basically I'm going to just kind of leave it there. I'm not going to test you on that. I would never do that. Uh, I'm just basically saying that when we start to develop certain conditions, that's when these things start to be created um, outside of the, the normal enzymatic processes. So uh, we'll just kind of leave that there and hit the ground running and, and just kind of move on to more important issues than going deeper into this. Um, so what are some sources of free radicals? Uh, this, is, this is pretty easy, right? UV radiation, environmental pollution, uh, leukocytes, radiation, any, any radiation, Unhealthy food, hmm, interesting. Bad habits, normal part of metabolism, right? Uh, and this is what I was talking about here, preservatives, dyes, tastes, uh, amplifiers, uh, and also just high quantities of food, right? High quantities of un, uh, unhealthy food. Um, those of you that are going into the um, tanning beds and 
tanning. Um, basically, you are producing free radicals, right? Radiation UV light. Uh, all, every moment you're in there, you're producing these really harmful oxygen radicals. Uh, so yeah, stay out of the tanning beds for the love of God, please, please don't go in there. But essentially we have endogenous sources and we have exogenous sources. And let's just kind of talk a little bit about the endogenous. And we already talked about this in great detail. So, um, let's just, let's just kind of go through it really quickly. Um, through the aerobic metabolism, aerobic organisms use oxygen. We talked about that, right? This has caused the production of free radicals. I, I even put the mitochondria here. So you know what are the major endogenous sources of it. Um, and then the exogenous sources, of course, would be, uh, you know, like smoking, alcohol, alcohol dehydrogenase, uh, alcohol. So the basically reduction or, or the metabolism of alcohol uh, actually produces a lot of free radicals as well. So a lot of pharmacology books talk about that. So you guys that are destroying your liver on the weekend, uh, drinking Coors Light and uh, other horrible tasting beers that are just cheap. I don't know what college kids drink these days, but I, I know when I was doing it, it was, uh, oh, I don't know if you guys, if any of you guys have ever been to Chicago, our major beer out there is old style and you've probably never even heard of it, but it's so cheap. And it's awful. So I know I did a lot of destruction to my liver with old style and probably created a lot of free radicals in the process. Um, and then uh, this is the most important endogenous source that we're talking about right now. So, um, so let's talk about some of the types of free radicals. And, and I already did that with you guys. I already kind of drew them for you. So um, let's look, let's look at these at a, with a little more detail here. So so once free radicals are formed, uh, they are difficult to control, and they usually form or initiate chain reactions that can create other free radicals. So I, I kind of showed you a drawing of that, um, and they're highly reactive because they want to interact with other things, um, and they will basically interact with any molecule in their proximity. So they have a very short half-life and they want to interact with things that are close to them. So here is kind of a, here's, here's a, uh, order of operations or a chronological order per se of those things that we are talking about. So if we have oxygen that receives one electron, we get superoxide. We, we've talked about that. If we get oxygen that receives an electron plus two hydrogens, we get hydrogen peroxide. If we get hydrogen peroxide and that receives another electron, we get a hydroxyl radical, right? Now let's count this one, two, three, four. How many electrons did I tell you oxygen wants to receive in order to be turned into water? I told you it wants to receive four electrons and it wants to see, receive four hydrogens, right? So here, is, this is just kind of showing you the various species that can be created when these complexes start losing electrons, right? So if we have, let me go back, if we have a uh, oxygen and it receives an electron, then we have superoxide. And then if superoxide receives an electron, we get hydrogen peroxide, right? And I showed you that in my drawing and so forth and so forth. So we can say that these hydrogen, these species of oxygens are, are, are truly intermediates of oxygen on its way to being, uh, to being turned into water, right? So, um, but these things, so this is a radical. This is non-radical and this is a radical. So within here, we have two free radicals and then here we have a non-radical. And these are these two here, uh, hydroxyl radical and superoxide are, are very, very dangerous. Um, so let's, let's talk about this a little more. So superoxide, superoxide, uh, this is a molecule that has gained an electron and become highly reactive. And it, it I have this picture here, right? So this one here, we gained an electron and now it's reactive. And here we can see we have oxygen and we have this one electron here, which is making it unstable. All right. So we can see that oxygen wants to have, um, it wants to have stability. It wants to have 
it wants to have paired electrons on the outside, but this 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 uh, uh, taking on of one single electron has made it incredibly unstable. Now, um, where else can superoxide be formed? Um, well. We talked about the electron transport chain. We know that lots of them are produced there. We know that there's certain enzymes both in the electron transport chain. There's also enzymes on um, phagocytes, also enzymes in skeletal muscle that will produce it. Um, and another source is heme proteins. So um, the heme that is in red blood cells can also be reactive. Um, and if we look at this here, um, molecules of oxy, oxyhemoglobin undergo decomposition and release uh, superoxide in that process. So about 3% of the hemoglobin uh, does this every single day. So you have this being released every day when a decomposition of red blood cells occurs. So uh, again, it's, it's kind of everywhere. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, hydrogen peroxide now. So that's this guy here, right? So we know that if we have oxygen and we receive an electron and then another electron, then we can turn into hydrogen peroxide here. Um, I, as I told you before, it's it's not a radical, uh, but it can cause damage uh, to the cell in relatively low concentrations. Um, and this one likes to bind to lipid bilayers or membranes. It, it likes to destroy them. So, um, and again, back to the Jekyll and Hyde thing, we used to think that uh, hydrogen peroxide was only a destructive free radical, but now they're seeing that hydrogen peroxide might act as a secondary signaling molecule, very similar to superoxide. So um, you guys can read a little bit about this. It kind of everything that I just mentioned is there. Um, and if this gets elevated, just like superoxide, this can lead to uh, uh, oxidative stress and also can cause lots of damage within the cell. And then lastly, um, we're going to talk about hydroxyl radical, which is this guy's really nasty. So this is like the, this is kind of like the final stage boss of free radicals. So in a biological body, hydroxyl radicals attack the cell membrane. Uh, they cause membrane damage. Um, they can destroy DNA. They can destroy DNA base sequences. Um, they induce disintegration of the double helix structure. They can cause cell death, cell mutations. So this one's really nasty. Um, and about 90% of consumed oxygen is, like I said, it's usually con usually converted to water, while the remaining 10% um, is converted into superoxide and um, hydrogen peroxide. So the, the majority of the free radicals that has been researched on are these two here. And one of the reasons is because this guy's half-life is a sliver of a second. So this one, it's really hard to trap this. There are methods they have where they can trap it and they can study it. Um, but it's really hard to study this because it's, it's, it's just on and off. And when it's on, it's just destroying whatever, whatever, whatever is nearby. Um, and, uh, yeah, this guy is, is pretty nasty. So, we talked about the major players, and, and there's many more. Uh, the nitric oxide is one that we, I would love to talk to you guys about because it's a, it plays a major role in exercise science, right? Nit nitric oxide, oxide. See, I'm getting to that point now where I've just been talking too much. Um, is plays a role in vasodilation, right? So, and that also belongs under the banner of reactive oxygen species, but that one's not a radical. So. Um, yeah, so let's kind of move on. So we 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 kind of know where these things come from. We know what they do. We know that they're destructive. Um, this one, I believe, this one has the longest half life. So this one can be on, uh, and this one I also believe can pass the lipid bilayer and move into other tissues where these two cannot pass the lipid bilayer. So this one can travel outside of the cell, and these two are staying in the cell, and they like to destroy things. Okay, guys, um, so we kind of went through some of the major radicals and uh, hydrogen peroxide, which is a non-radical. 
Um, we've talked about what they can do and uh, we showed you within the drawing uh, exactly where they are located. So now let's conclude this lecture and uh, we will let you guys get at it. So on this slide and the next slide, I'm just kind of repeating myself. So you guys can look at this one. You guys can look at this one. And uh, what I want to conclude with is talking about um, some of the molecular and some of the cellular alterations that free radicals can induce that will basically lead to disease. So I, I have this here and we're going to talk a little bit about molecular, a little bit about cellular, and then talk about how these can lead to certain types of diseases. And again, we're focusing primarily on metabolic production of free radicals and inflammatory production of free radicals. And again, um, these things are being produced everywhere. So multiple, multiple systems are producing these. And if we think about the inflammation piece here, you guys know that every time you exercise, whether you're bench pressing or running or sprinting or swimming, um, if you push yourself, you're going to have some soreness, right? You're going to have some, some DOMS occurring, some delayed onset muscle soreness. And one of the reasons we are going to have, um, free radicals produced during that process is because you're going to have acute inflammation. And the biggest takeaway from this is to understand that when we have a disease, free radicals are being produced constantly, chronically, and they're being produced in so many, in, in such a high concentration and, and quantity that the defense mechanisms we have within the cellular environment are overrun. They, there's too many of them to handle. Um, and what begins to occur there is that free radicals can create other free radicals. So they, they can propagate that kind of sequence, right? So if you have one free radical that steals an electron, well, when it steals that electron to create stability for itself by stealing that electron, it creates another free radical. And then that free radical will look st for stability and it can pull another electron for something else. And, and, and this, the sequence continues. So that's what happens when we have oxidative stress. We have way too many of them. They are creating others. It's almost like a zombie movie, right? You have one that emerges from the grave and, and then that zombie bites somebody and then you have two and then uh, those two zombies go bite another one and then you have three and six and 10 and 20 and 30. And then what happens is you have a town that is overrun by zombies because you have more of them than there are people to protect the town. And that's what these that's what these little rascals do is they they kind of propagate their signal or their they propagate their electron stealing ways and they create more radicals. And the more it's spread out within the cellular environment, the greater the damage that occurs. So again, the difference is in a disease state where you have oxidative stress and you have chronic radical production. And when we have something like exercise and inflammation, this is acute. It's on and then it's off. It just kind of serves its purpose and then it turns off and, uh, and that's it. So, um, so yeah, let's talk about some of the molecular stuff. So, uh, most importantly, uh, these radicals can, they can attack nucleic DNA, right? So they can destroy the, the DNA in here. They can attack the nucleotides. They can also attack mRNA right? So, or RNA, so messenger RNA or just RNA itself. So if you have, if you're experiencing, if your cell is undergoing translation and transcription, uh, sorry, transcription and translation, well, when a, when a DNA molecule is uh, exposed and uh, these base pairs here are undone and the um, RNA polymerase is there trying to transcribe a, a sequence of, D, of, of DNA, well, that mRNA can be attacked. It can be, it can undergo radical attack and, and it can either be destroyed or, or it can be altered. And if you alter the mRNA, well, when that mRNA gets to the ribosome, the ribosome is going to read the mRNA with the, uh, with the information in there that was attacked. And it's going to put together a protein that doesn't make sense. Right? So, um, those two things are very important to understand because that's what leads to either mutations or cancer uh, or changes in the gene, which we, we don't want. Um, and then another thing to consider is that uh, mitochondria also contains its own DNA. So it would make sense that the DNA that is damaged most in a cell is going to be the mitochondria DNA because 
most of these things are being produced in the mitochondria and therefore uh, they're going to attack what is in the mitochondria first. Um, so those are, those are kind of the, the molecular changes that can happen when we're talking about uh, DNA and RNA. Uh, something else to think about here, I just wanted to show you this to kind of remind you of where we started and where we are. We know that uh, mitochondria can produce um, both superoxide and it can produce hydrogen peroxide. And in the mitochondria, you have MN, which means mitochondria, SOD, and that means superoxide dismutase. So I told you we have some things in the cell that can neutralize these things. So here's, let's go back to the zombie, zombie story here, right? So we have a zombie being made and um, this is the, um, this is Rick from The Walking Dead and his little, his little gang, right? And they can neutralize this zombie and, and they can chain it up and use it for something, right? Use it as a guard dog in their little encampment. So, um, but when, when so much of this is produced, then Rick and his little band of um, survivors here, they won't be able to reduce this anymore, right? So the zombies are going to kind of, uh, they're going to overwhelm the protective system here. And then you start to have superoxide that leaves the mitochondria. Now, outside of the mitochondria, we also have more of Rick's little gangs from The Walking Dead. Here is superoxide dismutase outside of the cell. And if some of this mito if some of this superoxide gets out, well, this superoxide dismutase can neutralize it and turn it into hydrogen peroxide. And then hydrogen peroxide, if we have catalase, C-A-T, which is another one of the survivors of the zombie apocalypse, right? They can take this zombie and convert it into something that is non-threatening, which is water and oxygen, right? But again, if the zombies start to overwhelm superoxide dismutase and catalase, well, then this hydrogen peroxide can kind of recruit more zombies and they can go through something called the Fenton reaction. You don't need to know what that is. Um, and they can create hydroxyl radical. And, and this is a really nasty zombie because this is the one here that will attack the DNA and will also uh, induce lipid peroxidation, which is damage to the uh, lipid bilayer. So outside of just the mitochondria, we have this here, which is NADPH oxidase. And I mentioned that to you guys somewhere in a previous slide. I'm not going to go back. But I told you this is the one that we were researching in our lab, and um, this is in skeletal muscle. So this is an enzyme that has a bunch of bunch of subcomplexes. Um, so NOx is the primary complex. Uh, it has P22, P47, P. That's a mistake. Whoever made this, that should be P85, not P87. So that's that's an absolute mistake. And RAC. So these are these are just other proteins that basically bind to this primary protein to turn it on. So how this guy works is it takes NADPH and it will send it through the enzyme. And when it sends it through the enzyme, this, this enzyme here will take off a electron and it will put it onto oxygen. And then we have um, superoxide production. So this is another way that we can produce this. And again, superoxide can either go into superoxide dismutase and be converted into something less harmful, or if it's converted into something less harmful and there's just too much, too many free radicals in the cell, this can be converted into hydroxyl radical. And then we have, we have damage and damage and damage. And this leads to mutations and cancer and cellular aging. So this is also called cellular senescence. So uh, you are as old as your cells are. So if you are going to uh, be doing your um, ultraviolet, uh, not violent, <laughs> ultraviolet, uh, I, was, I was thinking about the zombie apocalypse. That's why I said ultraviolet. Um, if you're doing your tanning beds, right, and you're, you're doing that ultraviolet light, oh my goodness, uh, you are creating these much, much faster and your skin is going to look good for the time being, but you are basically accelerating the aging of your cells. If you're smoking, if you're drinking, you're doing that. Uh, also, if you're eating a diet that's high in saturated fats, 
uh, a diet that's high in iron. Uh, if anyone out there that's doing carnivore diets or um, doing the uh, what's the other one where you're just eating primarily uh, Atkins diet, uh, high high levels of iron uh, contain this right. Um, and this is highly reactive. So if you're eating high levels of iron, uh, you are creating a environment where you can have free radical production accelerated. Um, however, if you're eating lots of, lots of plants and you're eating a balanced diet, well, those plants are filled with antioxidants and that's what this is here. This is an antioxidant pathway and antioxidants are going to help neutralize these things much faster. So when people say, oh, you know, this is filled with antioxidants, you're like, holy crap, I know what that means now because I, I watched this video. Um, so yeah, so this is kind of just kind of refreshing your memory on what we talked about. Um, and then I got like two, three more slides here for you. So another thing to consider on a cellular level is that um, free radicals both initiate and exacerbate the development of pathological conditions. So a surplus of ROS in any tissue, again, causes reactive, causes oxidative stress. And this has various consequences on the system, one of them being chronic inflammation, the other being fibrosis. Uh, if you look here, you do not need to know this. I'm just trying, trying to reinforce uh, how nasty these critters are, these, these rascals. Um, if we just look at NADPH oxidase by itself, right? We're just looking at this. And we're not even considering this, nor the other enzymes in the body that produce free radicals. We're just we're just solely looking at this. This NADPH oxidase has been implicated in all these alterations: uh, neutrophil and phagocytosis. So chronic inflammation is turned on, and we know it's turned on because of this green arrow. There are alterations to thyroid hormone synthesis. So these could be either a decrease in hormones or an increase in hormones, but it, it basically is going to do something outside of what the thyroid should be doing at a basal state, right? We have a set point for hormone production. And when we produce free radicals, this changes that hormone production. And you know that hormones are created one place and then they trigger an effect somewhere else. So again, this is a domino effect. If chronic inflammation is on and then we have alterations in hormone signaling, uh, it's it's looking like it's starting out to be a bad day for you. Um, it can inhibit calcium and potassium channels. It can stop that so we can have neurological issues. Uh, it can increase calcium um, intake into the endoplasmic reticulum. And what that will do is that will cause morphological changes. And anytime we have an organelle in the cell that undergoes mor morphological changes, you change its form, you change its function, right? So now you have all these things faltering at, at a single time. Uh, let's look at another one. Eh, VEGF, we're, eh, we're not going to talk about veg, VEGF. Um, it can increase apoptosis. It can increase cellular senescence. Again, that's that aging. This here is representing cell growth and cellular division. These are the different stages of cell division. Uh, here we can see that it's increasing cell growth. So if we have apoptosis, cellular senescence, and cell growth happening at the same time, that's, that's the perfect recipe for cancer. Um, it can inhibit insulin signaling. So you'll become uh, insulin um you, you'll be insensitive to insulin, right? So insulin resistance, this will activate uh, pro-inflammatory genes. These are transcription factors here, and these transcription factors will turn on certain genes in the genome that will cause chronic inflammation. Uh, it will inhibit the differentiation of adipocytes. So we have pre-adipocytes that need to go under differentiation to be uh, fully mature adipocytes, and this will stop that. So you can see that this, this, these, these nasty rascals here, these free radicals, they can attack everything. It's not just lipids. It's not just DNA, but it's proteins, it's ion channels, it's genes, it's, it's changing how the cell ages, um, yeah, it impacts uh, gl glycolytic factors. This is obviously going to impact, um, you know, secretion and storage of fatty acids in adipocytes. So yeah, pretty nasty. And then lastly, um, this, uh, if we talk about lipid peroxidation, this is the lipid bilayer here, right? 
We know that uh, these free radicals like to destroy the lipid bilayer, and by doing so, uh, the contents of the cell gets into the interstitial space, and then we have kind of a bunch of nasty things floating around in the interstitial space, which is going to basically cause more inflammation and more damage. Um, and, and if those free radicals can escape and get into other parts of the tissue, well, they're going to cause damage there as well, right? So think of the zombie apocalypse once more. Um, one of the things that they do is if we look here, these are, this is, uh, your fatty acids and your phospholipids, right? These, these gray little balls here. And then here we have cholesterol, which is in red. So what the researchers are finding now is that not only do radicals destroy the lipid bilayer, but they also kind of reorganize it to make it weak. So if you see here, they've completely restructured uh, this lipid bilayer by kind of putting the cholesterol esters together and um, basically making a kink in the armor. So that, that's how they do that. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool and I wanted to show you that. And then lastly, um, here's the diseases that are involved in all of these things. So that's why I wanted to get you to this point, because I'm going to have you guys basically read about some of these diseases and what they are and basically how uh, free radicals help to create them. So that is all I have for you. Uh, please make sure you watch this video before you try to attack the uh, paper that I'm giving you guys and have a great week and I will be in touch soon.